Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, uh, Machine Learning for Customer Innovation with the Very Group. Uh, we're just waiting for other participants to join, and we will begin shortly. I can already see the participant numbers going up, which is brilliant. So we'll just give it a couple minutes, and then we'll start. It's always the, the awkward silence at the start of the webinars, uh, but we'll wait. I can see the participants going up, which is brilliant. For everyone who has just joined, uh, welcome to today's webinar, uh, Machine Learning for Customer Innovation with the Very Group. Like I said, we're just waiting for other participants to join and we will begin in a minute or so. Let's get started. So hi everyone and welcome to today's session. Uh, my name is Ellis Wadsworth and I'm a Senior Talent Acquisition, Acquisition Manager at HackerJob. And today I'm going to be the moderator of the Machine Learning for Customer Innovation event. So today we're going to meet amazing experts from the very group and get to know more about pricing and communication approaches, as well as machine learning. At the very group, technology has played a huge part in helping them transition from a catalog retailer to where they are now, a leading digital retailer that helps families get more out of life. During the webinar, we're going to talk about developing adaptive pricing strategies and putting customers at the heart of communications. So just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel. I'll bring them up during the presentation, but we also have time at the end uh, for questions too. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's speakers. First, we have Dr. Gokhan Samele, data scientist at The Very Group, and Dr. Rebecca McKenzie, Senior Data Scientist at The Very Group. So Rebecca, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Um, so hi everyone. Uh, as you said, so my name is Rebecca McKenzie. I'm a Senior Data Scientist at The Very Group. And I'm here to talk to you today a little bit about how we use data science, particularly from my end in marketing and Gokhan will talk a little bit more to you about the retail side of things. So before I start, I think I'd like to give you a little bit of a history on The Very Group. Um, essentially, we started in 1890 with K&Co, and we started as a catalogue brand. In the 1930s, Littlewoods was launched by the Moores family in Liverpool, and we first launched our e-commerce online business in 1990s. So this is right at the beginning of the online shopping in infancy. In 2003, we became Shop Direct from the merger of Littlewoods and the Great Universal Stores. And then finally, in 2009, we launched Ferry.co.uk to focus on the online shopping generation. Now, this was, turns out, it was an amazing move because we had record profits. And actually, as a result of that, we cut the catalogue entirely in 2015, went 100% digital and merged our heritage brands into Very and Littlewoods.com. In 2020, so just two years ago, we became the Very Group. So we renamed from Shut Direct to Very Group and our new fulfillment center became operational. So that means first and foremost, we are a digital company. Customers can interact with us via one of two ways, either via website, if you're on your desktop or your mobile device and via our app. So if you're iOS or Android. Now, behind that, there are a load of systems that allow us to interact with our customers and customers to interact with us. So we have stock systems to let us know what's going on in terms of when's the product coming in, when's it going out, how can we forecast that into the future. We have obviously the product management systems, everything from department level right down to the product itself and the variations of different products. We are we offer our own line of credit, so we do have credit and fraud systems in place. And obviously, we've got the more customer centric systems, so things to do with the call center, so customers can call us with any queries, complaints, and um, anything that they want to uh, update us on. And also the customer systems themselves, so customers have their own my account page, and they can make their own changes there. 
So first and foremost, we are a purpose and values led business. Um, we hear this, if you're working for the company, you hear this pr practically in every big meeting we ever have. So our purpose uh, is to make good things easily accessible to more people. And as a result of that, we have five values that we try and live by on our day to day working relationships. So this is ambitious, proud, trusted together and innovative. Now, I actually started the very, I joined the very group last August. And for me as a data scientist, this is a fantastic way to work. So I have um, a very small team that I work in. So there's three of us like, essentially in marketing at the moment. That expands to a wider team. So we've got our own essentially manager, if you like. And then I expand to the wider data science team. And then we work with a lot of other people across the business to try and constantly improve, constantly innovate. We're always looking, on, looking out for the latest technology that might help us in our day-to-day -day lives. So I really enjoy working here. And I love the fact that we live by these values. So the big question, data. So at Berry, data is at the heart of all of our operations. So this is everything from stock replenishment in our warehouses to gross demand against the wider market. And actually data is used to help us understand the health of the business, but more importantly, how we can provide our customers with a truly exceptional shopping experience. Now, I'm sure you're aware that big data is becoming a value commodity in the digital age. And so here at Vero, we have several key areas which derive different insights from our raw data. We have the analytics department within which there are several teams within, the, with, within that department that cater for different areas of the business. One example could be a team which understands how Vero has performed against the market and our key competitors. We also have the business intelligence team. So these are the guys that are responsible for the uh, up-to-date reporting, and that could be running at the hourly, daily, or even weekly rate. And they make these reports and um, documents and dashboards available to everyone within the business so everyone is able to get that insight quickly at the snap of their fingers essentially. Now obviously when we're using data we have to make sure that we're using it in a reliable, responsible and secure way as well as making sure we can use it in all areas of the business because we're trying to be data driven. Now first and foremost our customers do trust us with their data and that enables us in turn to innovate new solutions and it's the data strategy team that makes sure we're adhering to all of those guidelines. We also have the data engineering team. So understandably, the data is massive <laughs> and it's not just focused in one table. There's lots of tables, lots of databases. And the data engineering team are there to help us understand how we can store it, how we can process it in a way that's, in a, that's as efficient as possible. Essentially, we don't want to be building models that take almost a year to train. And then when you're trying to get the predictions out, they take twice as long. It's gotta be something that we can access really quickly. And then finally, we've got the data science team. So we work across all areas of the company and we're trying to help them solve uh, different problems. So who are the data science team and what do we do? So we actually focus on several key areas. We've got the central data science area, which is essentially how can we support different teams across the business to innovate and improve? We've got the digital product area, which is how can we improve our customer relationships and how can we, how can we provide the best shopping experience for them? We've also got the experimentation area. So how do we make informed decisions at scale when we implement changes? <coughs> So this would be uh, things around if we're trying to release offers, how can we make sure they're going to work? We have the retail area, which Gokum will be talking to you a little bit further about, but this is all about how can we make sure that we are making the most of our business processes and how can we forecast things that are going on in the retail environment? And then finally, I'm in the marketing area and the question we're trying to look at is what and when do our customers want to hear from us and how can we optimize our budget to maximize the performance? So uh, before I dive into that, I thought you might want to know who I actually am. So um, in a previous life, I was a biochemist. So I did my, um, my degree and my PhD at Manchester. I actually worked in four different labs. So I also worked partly at Liverpool as well. Um, in essence, I was growing yeast and counting proteins that uh, were created as a result of different stresses. The lab work was interesting. But I much more enjoyed doing the coding and the analysis work. So that was my kind of brief look into, hey, machine learning could be cool. So as a result of that, I ended up becoming a big data analyst at STFC. So these guys are a government funded company. And essentially we work with other researchers to try and introduce machine learning models into understanding their data. I then moved over into the Hartree Center. So as a senior data scientist for artificial intelligence, and this was all about helping companies to adopt artificial intelligence and machine learning. And then finally, uh, last August, I moved over to Vary. And for those who are interested, our offices at Skyway's house is actually an old airline hangar. Um, it's free floors, it's really cool. And inside it's all very open plan, very collaborative. So we do work on a hybrid approach. When we're in the office, it's very collaborative. We have lots of socials going on. And then obviously when we're at home, it's heads down, we get on with it, <laughs> essentially. 
So uh, data science, I'm sure a lot of you uh, listening are already aware of this, but I'll go over it anyway. So it is a life cycle. There is no, <laughs> as depressing as it sounds, there's no end point. It's constantly improving, which is both really cool. So um, problem definition, it, this could be something from either something we've thought up ourselves inside the data science team, or it could be someone from within the company have come to us with a, with a particular issue they'd like our help on. So let's say, for example, someone's come to us and say, right, I would like to identify which customers may be leaving the business and how can I help them? So that would be our problem definition. In the data science team, we go away and we have a look at the data and we see if we can build some sort of data science solution that could be doing that. Now, in this case, if we're saying, right, I want to try and find out who are leaving, it would be a model to predict on a scale of zero to one, how likely a person is to leave in the next time frame, say six weeks or so. Now, building a model isn't enough because someone's got to be able to use it. So we go for a deploy area essentially so we build the model make sure it's accurate first of all and then we make sure it's in a space where the results can be used and this is where the data strategy and the data engineering comes in uh, into a lot and that model then gets scheduled so depending on the requirements of it it could be hourly weekly monthly yearly in some cases um, and the results are easily accessible throughout the rest of the business now Again, we don't stop there. We need to make sure that model is going to consistently be accurate and as accurate as possible. So we go through a phase of monitoring. Now, hopefully, if we've done our jobs right, the model is stable and it's accurate and it's giving good benefits to the business for as long as possible. But we need to make sure we know and understand when that's no longer the case, in which case we have to review our problem definition and go back for it again. One key example would be any models, if you like, that existed pre-pandemic likely need updating now post-pandemic because the customer behaves significantly changed. So that's the kind of life cycle we're dealing with. So with that in mind, what do we actually do in marketing, in the marketing team? So there's a variety of, um, I guess, questions that we try and answer in terms of the problem definition. First of all, we ask who should we be targeting? So again, along the theme of um, who might be leaving the company, who do we want to make sure uh, we can engage a little bit more and make sure we're, they're finding what they're actually looking for. So this is all around churn prediction. We ask the question, what do we actually want to send to customers? So offer optimization, you know, what is the best offer we can give to a particular customer that will encourage them to find what they want and help them shop with us? Customer persona, which I'll just briefly go over, but we'll go into that in a minute anyway. We've got email recommendations. So when you get that email, when you open it up, all the recommendations are sending, that's a model in the background that's running and saying, we think because you're based on your browsing or purchasing behavior, here's your top five recommendations. As well as that, we've got cross-category prediction, which is all about um, we want to try and encourage shopping um, in as, as wide a range of areas as possible, as long as you're interested in them. So based on your browsing behavior, here's something else you might be interested in. Now, we like looking into the future because a lot of our business decisions are based on where we think we'll be next year. So we do something called future net dispatches. It's all about what your value will be next year. And then finally, obviously, at the end of the day, we are trying to make some profit. So we like to ask the question, if we don't send you an offer, are you going to shop with us naturally versus if we do send you an offer? So it's that question of um, if we only have 10 offers to send, who do we send them to versus um, if they would have shopped with us naturally? So I'm going to talk to you a little bit more in depth about the customer persona. So the question this asks is what departments do different customer groups shop in and how can we adjust our emails accordingly? Now, a bit of background into this. So way back, there was a calendar and everyone in the business who had ever um, ever interacted with menswear at any point in their customer life would have got an email, the same email on Tuesday and Fridays. Okay, very static. That's it. You're one size fits all. Um, I think everyone who's got raised eyebrows, I'm sure everyone has raised eyebrows on their own. That is not a good way to send communications. So we need to flip that on its head. So rather than saying find customers to send these offers to, we want to find customers, we want to find offers to send a particular group of customers based on what they're doing. So this asks the question, is there a particular profile for different departments? We don't want to treat everyone as exactly the same. We want to understand what that person's particularly interested in. If we do that, we can then adjust our calendar accordingly and we can get rid of this whole idea of Tuesday, Tuesday being menswear day. Okay, how do we do that? So we stop looking at customers as one person or one group, if you like, and we try and do some sort of clustering based on their browsing and ordering behavior at a department level. Once we've done that, we can run it through a clustering algorithm and what comes out is something that we might be able to use to help us inform our trading calendar. 
here's what that actually looks like. So if you imagine we've got about 2 million customers, uh, they've gone through our clustering algorithm, and all I've done here is color them based on the department that they seem most interested in. Now, the caveat here is this, this is just the most interesting. There are other departments that they will be interested, but this is one that's flagged up. Um, we like to call this the blob because there's not really much else going on. It's quite hard to see on a 2D plot. But if you imagine on a 3D plot, it might separate a bit further. But there's, there's basically two stories to this. One is that you, can, you do get some very nice clusters coming out. So for example, in the slightly lighter orange, there's a group of customers who are very interested in sports. We've got some who are very much only seasonal shoppers, but we still have a big blob. So everyone who's in the blue, so they're very much into generics. They shop widely across the business. Now that's fine, except for the fact that half of our customers match this at the moment. So that's not really something we can do. Okay, so what can we do? Well, all we do is throw it through the algorithm again and say, okay, well, we have our smaller segments grouped out already. Let's focus on just those that fit in generic, throw it through again, and let's see what comes out. And this is exactly what we've done. So on the left-hand side is that 1 million or so generic customers that even though we were only clustered once, there is still a very good group. But once we've thrown it through again, we actually get a very nice story coming out. Now, each column, if you like, is one of the independent clusters. And on the left hand side are all the different departments that we think they that they've been matched to be interested in. The number, the closer to one it is, the more interest they are, the, the more that that group has been engaged with that particular department. So the story that comes out actually is in the first cluster, so G0. These are people who are very much only interested in home electric. We can adjust our calendar for that. That's perfect. G1, these are, I love this story because G1, so the, the second cluster, um, it's women with kids or people who are shopping for women's and kids anyway. But they're also a little bit interested in sports where they're not particularly that interested in home and electric. Finally, we've got G2. Again, it's a generic, but despite that, this is a much smaller group of people. So we have a bit of a story we can work with. There are some who are generic, that's fine, it's okay. This ends up being about a third of the entire group essentially. G3, I really like because this is different to the group in G1. These are people who shop women's wear, but don't shop at all, or barely interact with the children's wear or the kids, the kids department as all. Well. So there's very distinct areas. But these people, unlike G1, do shop in home electrics. So there's a very different profile going on there. And then finally in G4, these are those who are shopping for men's and sportswear. Now, as a result, you can see that there are some clear definitions coming out and there's some clear profiles and we can adjust our tradings calendar. So this is cool. So we can't <laughs> Tuesday is no longer menswear day. This is amazing. So it means that for every single cluster we have, we can adjust our trading calendar. So let's say we're looking at women's and kids. Throughout the week, they will only receive emails based on those that they have uh, shopped in, but they're also getting a wider range of departments uh, advertised to them. And similar for other departments. And what you'll see is when you compare two clusters, it's very rare that they get the same emails and they're treated the same as people within another cluster. Now, what happens um, in the background, this model's now been scheduled and it runs on a weekly basis. So once you're putting a cluster, you can then move out of it, depending on the most up to date data. Um, and this is really cool. So this is something that's been uh, thrown into the mix at the moment. We're currently testing. We're going to see how it goes. But it, it's, it means we can diversify our content and help people actually get to where they want to be on our various websites. So that is my presentation on the marketing side. I'm going to hand you over to Gokhan now, who's going to talk to you a little bit about pricing. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Gyokan and uh, I work as a data scientist at the very group. Uh, today I'm going to talk about how data science intersects uh, with pricing in our business. <clears throat> so before I do so, uh, let me briefly introduce my background. Uh, I joined the very group slightly more than a year ago, that's shortly after Rebecca. Uh, and this is my uh, second professional role in the retail industry. Uh, throughout my master and doctoral studies, I served as a research assistant uh, at Istanbul Technical University, uh, during which I focused mainly on retail analytics and quantitative marketing as well. So uh, the transition from, from uh, academia to, to industry has been relatively smooth for me in terms of domain knowledge. Uh, yeah, uh, next slide, please. Uh, in this session, uh, first I'll try to give you a bit of context on why price is particularly important in online retailing and how wary approach is pricing. And then I'll give an overview of the different ways our work in data science support pricing strategy and decision making. After that, we will zoom into two cases where data science and machine learning help the business understand pricing-related customer behaviors. 
then I'll talk about our ways of working. Finally, Rebecca and I will respond to your questions. Uh, I think uh, anyone in this session would agree that price is an important aspect in online retailing. But we went one step further than that and identified that it is in fact the most important criteria, both for choosing an online retailer and a net promoter score, which is an indicator of customer satisfaction and loyalty. And imagine this survey was conducted even before the cost of living crisis we are facing today, which has direct implications for online retailers. Next one, please. Yeah. Uh, a more recent market research found that with the increase in the cost of living, customers in the UK tend to favor online shopping to offline due to ease of price comparison and finding good deals. And they also prefer flexible online payment methods more than before, such as buy now, pay later, or paying in installments. On the flip side, uh, they reduce their spending on non-essentials and want, want more help from retailers to deal with these rising prices. Next one, please. Uh, under such circumstances, um, Very aims to take the price off the table for the customers. Uh, we already provide flexible payment options as an integrated retailer and financial services provider. And we also aim to be priced competitively, but do that for the right products at the right time so that we satisfy our customers and meet our business objectives at the same time. Uh, as data scientists, we work on providing data-driven solutions uh, to pricing-related business questions and eventually uh, support decision-making. Next one, please. Uh, well, as you see, our data science work in pricing spans uh, several different topics, which can be classified as inference, uh, prediction, optimization, and measurement. Uh, some of the, these topics feed the others, but the ultimate goal is to drive decisions uh, in pricing. Uh, for, I mean, each of these uh, topics require a session of its own. So I'll uh, try and focus on the inferential part where we try to understand the customer and market behavior. So one of the key things that we do using uh, data science is understanding customer sensitivity to price changes and quantifying it for different products. Next one, please. Uh, price sensitivity is generally measured by estimating uh, what's called price elasticity of demand, which is the percentage change in demand in response to a percentage change in price. Uh, typically, uh, demand for a product has an inverse relationship with its own price, as you can imagine, whereas a positive one with the prices of competitors or substitute items. Next one, please. Uh, at very uh, price elasticity estimation, uh, and we estimate both own and competitive price elasticities, uh, and the estimation process has a typical ETR workflow, starting with data collection, followed by pre-processing, regression modeling, and reporting outputs into our databases. Uh, then these elasticities feed into a number of key processes within our business, such as dynamic pricing, uh, optimization tools, demand forecasting, and product segmentation. Uh, for example, uh, here we see the frequency distribution. Uh, of price elasticities uh, for different products in one of our departments. Uh, we estimate the products on the left-hand side of the, uh, of the dashed line to be price elastic, and, uh, to price elastic. and you go, uh, when you go further left uh, on the scale, the, the, the product becomes more price elastic. Such, and this suggests that customers will respond strongly to a price change. Whereas the demand response to the price changes uh, on the right-hand side is estimated to be weaker. Next one. Yeah. Uh, estimating price elasticities uh, is easy. It's just the slope coefficient. But estimating them accurately can be very challenging 
uh, due to several factors, uh, such as data sparsity uh, or confounding variables. So uh, we have to control for them, for their effects. Uh, therefore, uh, we are, as, as Rebecca mentioned, I mean, data science processes are continuous processes, and therefore we are on a continuous journey of uh, improving our price elasticity estimations uh, by using more advanced machine learning algorithms and addressing these uh, the limitations of each as we go along. So uh, earlier we started with the rich regression model. So now we are about to release a more advanced tree-based model, which is based on a uh, gradient boosting machine and, and a combination of gradient boosting machine and ordinary release squares regression. And we go, we would like to take it further by, by implementing multi-level multi uh, hierarchical Bayesian mo regression models. Uh, so in each case, we address the limitations of, of the previous models. Uh, another uh, pricing related use case of data science is product segmentation for better price perception. Uh, next one, please. Uh, in this one, uh, we try to identify the known what is called known value categories and known value items, which are the products that are most likely to drive customers' price perception for the retailer. So typically, these are products for which customers tend to research, compare, and memorize prices, uh, and can easily build a reference price. And the and now you know what price sensitivity is. For these products, the demand is highly price sensitive and price elastic. So you can imagine these kind of products in your own shopping experiences where you search for the price extensively, whereas in others, you don't care about the price too much and just and you, you, you don't know about what the price of a product should be. So you make a more a less informed decision, right? Uh, so we need to identify this segment because, as I pointed out earlier, we want to be more competitively priced where price matters the most to our customers. We don't have to be super competitive in every product, but focus on the products that matters the most. For, for this purpose, we have been uh, building a data-led methodology uh, to segment our products uh, so that we can make more intelligent uh, pricing decisions. Next one, please. Uh, similarly, uh, product segmentation starts with data collection. We, we collect lots of information re regarding price sensitivity, product comparability, competitive intensity, popularity of the product, and performance, uh, both at category and product level. Uh, and then we uh, engage in future engineering, handling of outlier and missing values, uh, and data scaling. Uh, this is followed by, by the segmentation for which we use uh, clustering and weighted scoring algorithms at different levels. And finally, we report segment memberships uh, and segment profiles to match them with the suitable pricing strategies. We regularly uh, tune these uh, segments by uh, scenario modeling. So we we measure the impact or relative impact of different segmentation alternatives so that we can tune our segmentations. Uh, next one, please. Uh, as an example, uh, we use K-means clustering technique uh, to identify similar groups, groups of product categories based on features representing how important the category is to our customers in terms of price by by just collecting data regarding product comparability, price sensitivity, and customer interest. And also we, we just look at on the as another dimension how important it is to vary in terms of performance. Can we invest in price in these products? Is it is it does the margins allow us to invest in these products? So we, we look at both of these dimensions and determine which uh, which items should be the, the non-value items and non-value categories. So here you see the small group uh, cluster number six is identified as the KVC 
but we also uh, identified different uh, different uh, characteristics for different clusters, uh, such as traffic and basket drivers, margin drivers, uh, which are categories which are price sensitive, but not as much as KVCs are called warm segments and so on. So, uh, so the, the clustering is done automatically this way, and we only need to name what they are depending on where they stand uh, based on these features. Uh, yeah, next one, please. So, uh, so I mentioned just two use cases, but we have several uh, exciting projects in our roadmap, uh, either to improve our inferential or predictive uh, capabilities in, in pricing. Uh, again, each deserves a session of its own to go through them, uh, but you can be sure that any potential joiner to, to pricing data science will not be short of uh, exciting stuff to work on. Uh, yeah, next one, please. Uh, we implement uh, agile Scrum frameworks, uh, framework. Uh, uh, some of you might already be familiar with this uh, if you are coming from an IT background. Uh, we use this for product development in pricing. And we are part of the development team as data scientists within the squad. Uh, we usually work in three week sprints and attend various ceremonies to discuss uh, our progress. Uh, apart from that, we have regular meetings uh, with the wider data science teams to share our knowledge in various areas uh, or share our own projects uh, with the wider data science team in different areas. And we also engage in external learning and development via platforms such as Udemy and, and DataCamp. Uh, when it comes to working uh, at the very group in a broader sense, uh, the company adopts a flexible and uh, hybrid working strategy. So what matters more is, your, your, is what you deliver and how you fit into the values of the company rather than where you work, what time do you start working and what time you end. You finish working. Uh, so uh, also the company promotes, promotes diversity and inclusion and support colleague-led initiatives such as women at very race at very and uh, LGBT plus communities. And we also take, in, take part in, in regular social events, uh, as Rebecca mentioned, uh, where we also raise money for charity. Uh, here you can see us uh, proudly posing in front of the famous Kevin Club in Liverpool uh, during a scavenger hunt. Next one, please. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, if you are interested in uh, data science or other roles in tech, uh, the good news is the Wary Group is hiring at the moment. Uh, so we encourage you uh, to browse the website, um, check the roles, and apply if you think you would be a good fit. Uh, I'm sure you might have questions, so don't hesitate to ask them to us or, or to our super help, helpful talent acquisition team if you have questions. So uh, that was all from my side for the session. Uh, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Rebecca and Gokhan, for your presentations then. Um, so we will get straight into some of the Q&A questions that were submitted uh, prior to, to the event. Um, so the first one for you, Rebecca, um, what are the ways to innovate customer experience, would you say? Um, so I'd say that as a company, we're always looking to improve what we're actually doing for our customers. And that obviously starts with better understanding them. Um, so, for example, in data science, we produced a range of models. And that goes from identifying the customer profiles, as you've seen today, to what could actually be driving our positive and negative feedback when we receive it from the customers. So with these insights in mind, we can actually start acting on these to better provide the customer experience. Brilliant. And um, Gokka, next one for you. Um, how does machine learning change customer interaction and the customer experience? Well, uh, machine learning can uh, indeed have a massive impact on these. Um, I can give you a couple of examples from our own practices. Uh, today, Rebecca and I talk about marketing and pricing, uh, but we also have a wonderful data science, have wonderful data science and experimentation team. 
uh, they measure, for example, whether our changes in, in our customer interface uh, leads to significant improvements, statistically significant improvements in key metrics uh, using methodologies such as A-B testing and quasi-experimentation. So that's, that's one of the key things that where we use uh, experimentation and, and drive uh, the value of customer interaction. Uh, another example uh, where we use machine learning algorithms is understanding the, the drivers of net promoter score, which I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation. Uh, this is a measure of a direct measure of customer experience, and we try to understand what drive the score. Uh, more and what, what doesn't contribute to the score by using machine learning. So these are two examples, but there are more use cases, of course, within uh, our business or across different businesses, uh, such as sentiment analysis or NLP methods or, um, for, for reviewing customers, uh, I mean, for, for evaluating customer reviews and so on. So it's, why it's very important uh, in terms of customer interaction and customer experience. Okay, fantastic. And um, Gokhan, you mentioned uh, uh, earlier about cluster analysis. Um, for those that aren't as um, knowledgeable on the subject, what, what are the sort of steps of, of cluster analysis? Mm -hmm. A clustering analysis is, a, is an optimization method to find the groups within, within observations that are similar to each other by minimizing the, the distance between uh, minimizing the distance between similar observations and maximizing the distance between groups. So this is an automated algorithm. So optimize these distances using Euclidean distances and other dist or other distance measures. So the, the purpose here is to find groups that are very similar to each other so that we can either uh, develop targeting strategies for, for, for groups rather than individual observations, which is, which is a very cumbersome process, right? So this can be done for, for products, as I, as I mentioned, and as I, as I described in, in my presentation, or this can be for customers, as Rebecca mentioned in her presentation. So clustering mm -hmm. can, be, can be done for different units of observations. So it's very, it's very, it has a very diverse uh, application. Cool, thanks for that, Gokhan. So um, in regards to, uh, so we've actually got some live questions coming through from the Q&A now. Um, so Rebecca, I think this may be for you. Um, and this is from uh, Mohammed. Um, are you employing any controversial AI to decipher issues faced by, by customers and drive internal efficiency from customer feedback slash reviews? Yeah, so this is actually something that we're spooling up at the moment. So one thing we're really interested in is the net promoter score, which obviously looks at both the positive and the negative feedback. And we're really interested in what's driving that. Now, obviously, we can go through all the different features, you know, so how, how recently have they purchased, how recently they called us. But actually, the most information we're going to get is out of those reviews and out of the conversations we're having with them on the, on the phones. So something that's currently um, looking into at the moment is a text classification. So this is all around topic modeling about what's happened in that conversation and see if we can identify particular topics that align with different scores that are coming through as a result so watch this space but it is, it is something that we're looking into at the moment brilliant and uh, Rebecca straight back to you um, from our uh, questions prior to the event um, what is the connection between data and machine learning and customer loyalty and um, so there is a lot <laughs> Uh, so obviously, first of all, we need to be able to identify those who we might see as loyal. Now, loyalty will be very um, customer specific. So, um, you know, do you define it as someone who shops with us on a weekly basis? Is it someone who whenever they're buying furniture, they'll know to come straight to us? So being able to understand those sort of patterns is really important. So we use our data to do that. And once we've identified those, those patterns, such as the typical shopping cycle for each customer, and again, this is used using our data analytics, the data science department, and understanding that we can help us decide when is the right time to contact them? Um, when is it too much? To you know, we don't want to contact them every day. So, hey, rem remember us. Like that, that's an easy way to stop someone uh, <laughs> interacting with you. But actually yeah. helping them find what they're actually looking for um, by looking at all the data behind. Brilliant. Um, so over to you, Gokhan. Obviously, you mentioned at the end of your presentation that uh, the very group are sort of hiring at the moment. Um, what are the career opportunities for those who would like to join um, the very group? Is there spaces in your team? Just touch on yeah. that for us. Yeah. Uh... Well, the company has been heavily in that investing in its tech capabilities recently, 
and it's one of the top priorities at the moment. And obviously that includes uh, investing in talented tech people. Uh, therefore, we usually have, not only now, but we usually have in the, in the past couple of months or years, uh, various openings in tech, which mm. you will see when you browse the website. Uh, in addition to the regular vacancies, the company also provides opportunities for people at different stages of their careers uh, with programs such as graduate schemes. Uh, return yep. schemes and and placements and internships and so on so there are a wide range of opportunities for those who who are interested in joining uh very the very group but more in particular since we are talking about data science and machine learning at the moment we are also hiring for data scientists uh right now so we have an open position so we look forward to applications for that yeah, and we can definitely plug all of that at the end of the event. Um, and just touching on that, is there any like for, for hiring for data scientists for the very group? Is there any particular um, like career history or projects that you look for? Or are you just looking for sort of the the tech skills and it doesn't really matter what industry they're in? Ideally, the same industry as the very group. But is that something that you really pick up on when you're looking at applicants? Well, I can say we as a data scientist, uh, as a data science, we are a very diverse and heterogeneous group of people. So some people are coming from, from uh, technical backgrounds, from, from com computer software engineering stuff. Uh, some are coming from, from uh, natural sciences, so like, like biochemistry, as in, as in Rebecca's case. Yeah. Or in my case, I come from more management side, but I was trained for econometric modeling. So uh, I, I contribute in uh, the, to, to the company a different way. So the company is quite agnostic in terms of your, your skill set and just open to different, open to people with different capabilities and different mm -hmm. skills. So you don't have to be discouraged as a candidate if, you, if you're not ticking all the boxes in a, in a job application. So the company is quite open to, to de development uh, in-house uh, as well. So uh, I would strongly recommend uh, the candidates who are interested in not to be, not to be worried too much about, uh, uh, about the, the all, ticking all the boxes, as I, as I said before. Brilliant. And as, for example, a junior data scientist in the very group, is there like courses, like external courses or like training programs you have? Obviously, you'll be working alongside senior data scientists and being mentored, I presume. Uh, but is there any yeah, courses and stuff like that they can get involved in? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we have uh, partnerships with, with yeah. Udemy, as I mentioned yeah. in my presentation. Yeah. So uh, we have licenses available and we have licenses available for data camp. So the, uh, the, the junior data scientists can learn these kinds of uh, the machine learning and data science skills by, by taking courses from these, uh, from these uh, platforms. Uh, and mo mo most importantly, we support them wholeheartedly uh, as more senior ones uh, yeah. when they join the business uh, and support them with all their needs, both technical needs and non-technical needs, and try to be try to mentor them uh, in the best way we can. Brilliant. Um, so one for you, Rebecca, from the live Q and A. Um, on this is from Mohammed again. On the ways of working, do you find it easy to estimate um, data wrangling or an innovative piece of work? Um, so I think the short answer, I think that every single data scientist probably know, but actually one of the benefits of working in the very group is that all our stakeholders are also internal. So they're mm. very aware of the challenges that we'll face when, face, when, when dealing with the data. So um, typically, obviously, I think everyone knows that data wrangling is probably the hardest bit is that you go in quite naively thinking, oh yeah, all the data is there. And then three weeks yeah. later, you're still trying to find for that one feature that might help. But mm. um, yeah, so essentially give as much time as you can to the data wrangling, but con continuous updates with stakeholders and everyone's really on board so it's quite cool cool brilliant uh, and straight back to you rebecca um what is important when communicating with customers and how do you understand this during analysis 
Um, so in a nutshell, this is exactly what the experimentation team are there for and they support on a day to day basis with this. Um, so this could be something as simple as sending out a test email to a very particular group of people and yeah. we we reserve another group that we just don't send anything to. And we can see what the difference is based on the communications. It could be something as, you know, we'll include a picture on this email, we don't include it on the other, and we'll just see what the difference mm. is. And that's exactly what the experimentation team are there for. So yeah, definitely need them. <laughs> cool. And um, Gokan, one for you. Um, what are the technologies very group um, are looking for in candidates, like specifically for the data science candidates? Yeah, uh, yeah, many are concerned whether uh, they they should be using R or Python. This is this is generally the main question around around data science application. But we are using both. Uh, just just to be clear, uh, I mean we are very pragmatic when it when it comes to just uh, implementing and deploying our models. So we choose the the, the programming language that is best. Uh, for that, for the for the for the specific purpose of the project, sometimes there is a pa package for it, for instance in R that's more suitable for our uh, for our particular project. So we choose to work with R, whereas in some others Python is more suitable. So we work with Python. So in terms of programming languages, we use Python, R, and and also we have uh, we we use SAS uh, in data mm -hmm. science, yeah. uh, uh, which is not open source. Uh, uh, also, we have we use a lot of different platforms. So for cloud computing, we do a lot of work. Or, or for, I mean, most of our work in AWS, uh, Amazon yep. Web Services. Uh, we use uh, SageMaker instances uh, like states, uh, step functions for deployment, S3 for storage, and so on. We have Alation for for data governance and data cataloging uh, capabilities. So we have a wide range of texts uh, for, for, for databases. We use uh, SQL queries and, and Teradata uh, platform. So we have so many of them. So maybe I will not remember every every, every single <laughs> platform that we are using at the moment. So Rebecca, help me if I, if, I, if I skip something. No worries. And would you, would you advise for obviously um, junior, even developers or data scientists to um, learn about these cloud platforms, the AWS, Azure, GCP, because obviously it's very prominent in, in the tech world today. Would you say it, just to have a bit of a head start to sort of get in, get your head into to the sort of cloud platform side of things? Yeah, I was myself uh, not using uh, AWS before coming here. So yeah. uh, I was helped by by my colleagues uh, and uh, our machine, especially our machine learning engineers. To be to be, to become familiar with with AWS modules, so I, so I could just use it for my day day to day work, mm -hmm. uh, and also AWS has a has a has a very nice documentation, uh, it's an open source documentation which um, uh, data scientists can refer to or machine learning engineers can refer to whenever they need. So uh, machine learning engineers also encourage. Uh, people to use these documentations and they mm -hmm. also write their own documentations internal documentations within the business so that we can we can refer to them and they are really nicely written by our colleagues so so i use them uh, most of the time without asking any question cool um and one for you uh Gokhan again um is it important to have different payment method methods for example buy now pay later etc uh, yeah, as I, as I pointed out uh, earlier, it's, it became really important because uh, a lot of customers are, are on a budget right now. So a lot of families are on a budget. So they are trying to just find flexible ways of payment uh, yeah. due, to, due to their restricted budget allocation uh, yeah. during, this, during this cost of living crisis. So, uh, so the very group, I mean, the very is an, is an idea, I mean, can be an ideal choice for, for, for the customers so that they, I mean, has already integrated uh, flexible payment options long time ago. It's already an integrated retailer and, and, and financial services provider for a long time. So that's, that's a great option for customers to, to, to have these flexible ways of payment and, and, uh, and uh, buy the things that they want. Cool, brilliant. Um, and one for uh, you, Rebecca. Um, how this is from Leighton. How aligned are the social touch points with email, and how are clients tracked essentially? 
Yep, so um, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you because that's not something I've directly been working at. But we have loads of reports from the BI team, so the business intelligence team, that have looked at that, that on a daily basis. So that is something that is being tracked regularly. Um, and this could be things from um, where, how we contact them through SMS, email, and vice versa. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, the rate of opening as well, which unsurprisingly is probably a lot less than the, the mm -hmm. rate that we're sending out. But yeah, that is all tracked on a day-to-day -day basis. Brilliant. Um, so, Gokhan, over to you. Um, so, we had a question earlier. Um, I'm a software engineer with six plus years of experience, but I want to make a switch to machine learning. What advice would you give in this case, and how would you make that switch? Uh, well, uh, an experienced software engineer obviously uh, possesses strong programming and product development skills, right? Uh, yeah. And both of which are already big pros in, in terms of a potential switch. Uh, so my humble advice would be complementing these uh, skills uh, by understanding the foundations of the theory. So the statistical learning theory, uh, as well as the common unsupervised and su supervised uh, machine learning techniques. So once this is done, uh, it will be useful uh, to gain experience in, in implementing these in different case studies or mm -hmm. hackathons, uh, or for example, by participating in, in Kaggle competitions or Kaggle case studies. Uh, and once they feel confident, they can already start applying to DS and machine learning jobs. Cool. Um, and I'm not sure who wants to take this one, but what would you say, probably Rebecca, um, what would you say the most important data um, What's the most important type of data for retail businesses to collect? Oh, <laughs> bit, bit, bit of a vague, bit of a vague yeah, one. Um, just throwing I would there. argue, I, I'd respond for a question actually, and yeah. what are you trying to do with the data? So mm. um, it could be things like, you know, if we're trying to look at the NPS, we're really interested in the review data. If we're looking at customers' behavior, we're not going to be interested in review data at all. So my first question to you is, what, what are you trying to do? And then define what the way your data is going to be for that. Mm -hmm. exactly. So yeah, vague answer back, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. Uh, Gokhan, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Or have we got uh, any more questions? <laughs> I think there was a, a question in Q&A uh, from Emmanuel asking, do you hire people from outside the UK? That That's a question for the talent acquisition team. But I mean, I myself was hired from outside the UK. So this is obviously an option. So you, you I mean, don't be discouraged just because you're outside the UK and just yeah. uh, apply. If you, I mean, the company is focused on more on your skills rather than where you come from or, or mm -hmm. your background. So I encourage him to, to just, I mean, apply if he fit, finds a suitable fit uh, for, for any job. Yeah, and I believe obviously post COVID as well, a lot of companies have adopted that hybrid or fully remote working. So I wouldn't be like you said, be discouraged if you're not not based in the UK. Um, Rebecca, another one from the live Q&A Q from Ashok. So as I saw, you have a cluster structure, uh, like a woman with kids and a woman without kids, man, etc, with different clusters. Uh, why can't we maintain a single cluster? So this all comes down to the problem statement at the beginning. So our goal here was to try and identify different groups where we can tailor our emails accordingly. So if you imagine you're someone who very much only shops in the men's department, you do not want emails from us or even any sort of profile about women and children's wear. And likewise, the same for women who might not be shopping at all for, for children's wear. You want to be treated very differently. And that's why we kept them as separate cluster clusters for this. Makes sense. Um, and we've got another one. I'm not entirely sure um, who would like to take this. So we've got a, quite a few questions coming in now. So Rebecca, I think this one will probably be best for you. So data engineering and data science, I believe, go in hand in hand and complement each other. Data science and machine learning is essentially the end user of data brought in by the data engineer. So the question is, uh, what would the ideal data engineer and data scientist relation look like? And what is the best way for them to work together? So ideal relationship is very much a two-way one. So the data engineer, as you say, is the one bringing in all the data and making sure we can access it. But at the same time, if we find something that's not there, we've got to be able to feed it back and say, actually, is there a way to do this in a perhaps more efficient way? So um, one example for us is that we use Teradata. So we need the data engineers to make sure all the data is accessible to us there. We've also got the folk who help us with the models. And when we're actually... Um, Oh, well, I've got the word now. Uh, when we're actually deploying the model, sorry, we need to make sure it's accessible across all the different environments. And that's very much a two-way relationship. Here's our requirements. Could you change it? And likewise for them as well. 
they want to make sure that we're not completely breaking the system by making unefic unefficient queries. So two-way relationship, definitely. Cool. Um, and Susan asked a question, but I believe um, your sort of career, um, Rebecca, sort of answers this. Um, but Susan's been working in the pharmaceutical and biotechnology research and, and development, focusing in compliance. Um, are there possible job opportunities for her at the very group? Yes, so it sounds like you've got a lot of um, transferable skills, certainly around the compliance stuff, especially with dealing with a lot of data. So I'd point you at the Very Group website, have a look on there to see what's available. But yeah, certainly it sounds like you've got very useful things, particularly in that industry anyway. Brilliant. So I believe that's um, all the time we have um, for today. I just want to um, remind everyone that the, the team at the Very Group are actively hiring right now. Um, and as a follow up, we will provide a link for their careers page where you can find the list of open positions as well as their benefits. And if you are interested in career opportunities, please register via the form in the email and uh, we will come back to you. But I just want to say a big thanks to, to Gokhan and Rebecca today um, for their uh, for their presentations um potentially let's just let's just get one more q a question in there from daniel uh we don't want to leave you hanging there daniel so um do you i don't know who wants to take this but do you recognize any certification from mooc if if he wants to apply for any any jobs i'm not entirely sure what that certification is um, coursera like coursera i was going to say any sort of relevant experience is useful we're not going to write anything out if that makes sense though so, oh well, yeah. you went there no not at all it's basically what can you bring to the table so if you can show what you've got what the research is that you've done even um you know mini projects that you've done yourself if you've got your own git repo that's going to look good <laughs> so yeah definitely brilliant thanks for that, daniel so yeah thank you once again rebecca and gokan um for sharing some light on your career and what the, what you do best at a very group um is there anything you'd like to add before we uh finish today's webinar Oh, thank you for having us. Yeah, likewise. You're very welcome. Thank you so much.